Carl Terrell Mitchell, aka Twista, would be born in Chicago, Illinois in November of 1973. He grew up on the west side of the city, particularly in the K-Town area. He describes growing up in Chicago as being fun, but also rough at the same time. Twista began rapping in his adolescent years, being inspired by the likes of New York rap legends such as LL Cool J, Run DMC, The Beastie Boys, and many more. As a kid, he was a break dancer and beatboxer, which were two things that were very prevalent in the early stages of hip hop. Twista dabbled in rap, but was more so a beatboxer until he saw Dougie Fresh do both. This changed everything for him because prior to this, Twista wrote some rhymes for his friends and brother. After seeing Dougie Fresh, Twista would beatbox and rap as well. This would be around the age of 13 or 14. High school is when Twista really started coming into his own with rapping. He would attend Collins High School. While at this school, Twista would really get his name out there in Chicago by battle rapping in school and in different hoods around Chicago. When he first started rapping, he he was doing it in a way that many people consider normal. After a while, he decided to rap fast in spurts in his rhymes, but then came up with the idea of rapping a whole song fast. The rap style that Twista is known for is chopping. This is one of the names that this rap style is known by depending on where you're from. The origins of this rap style and who originated it is a bit messy to say the least. Some people will say that Twista started it, Bone Thugs and Harmony started it, or even go as far back as to say that Big Daddy Kane started it. Jazz O, Jay Z, The Fushnikens, and many more also had fast rap styles back in the day. The answer depends on who you ask, and Twista in particular would get into it with multiple rappers over this style. Tretch from Naughty by Nature and Bone Thugs and Harmony are two examples of this. Twista's issues with Bone Thugs and Harmony would get covered on the Beef 3 DVD, and last year, Twista would talk about how his issues with Tretch got resolved on drink champs. But back to the timeline and Eric the Wiz, a DJ of urban contemporary radio station WGCIFM in Chicago would discover Twista and become his manager. Twista originally rapped under the name Cavalier before changing it to Tongue Twista until he finally changed it to Twista. But Eric is the man who brokered Twista's two album deal with Los Angeles based Zoo Entertainment. There were a lot of rappers in Chicago at the time, but Twista is said to be one of the first to gain national attention. It's really a toss up between Twista and Common because they both came out around the same time. In 1991, under Zoo Entertainment would come the release of Tongue Twister's first single, Mr. Tongue Twister. The single did not chart on the Billboard Hot 100, but did manage to sell more units in four other cities than Chicago. This is said to have been partly because the song did not make the regular playlist of any major radio station in Chicago, especially WGCI. WGCI's programming director would say that he felt like the song was too fast and too hard to understand. This was the opposite of what the at the time music director of KPWRFM, which is a radio station in Los Angeles, said about the song. The woman would say that Mr. Tongue Twister was a really clever novelty song that got a lot of requests for a few weeks. I mean, she did call it a novelty song, but about this situation, Eric would say that Chicago was doing Twista how people were doing R. Kelly. He said that no one paid attention to R. Kelly in Chicago until he got strong support in other cities. After this, people from Chicago claimed R. Kelly as their own due to him being from the city. Twista and his team really fought hard for local support, and 1992 is when he gained national attention by earning the title of world's fastest rapper from the Guinness Book of World Records. With the speech pathologist at hand, he managed to rap 598 syllables in just 55 seconds. This beat the previous record holder by 70 syllables. 
Just for reference, the average speaking rate for an adult is between 180 to 220 syllables per minute, or between 140 to 160 words per minute. The craziest thing about this is that Twista still had time on the clock. He actually could have gone faster, but he kept messing up trying to go too fast. Another problem that he had is that at the time, he recently wrote the verse to break the world record, but did not have enough time to memorize it. Twista breaking the world record would be a big deal with it being documented on Yo MTV Raps. The release of Twista's debut album was set to coincide with him breaking the record. He would release his debut album, Running Off at the Mouth, in early June of 1992 and break the record later on that month. It should also be mentioned that Twista was also signed to Loud Records. In fact, he was the first artist to be signed to the legendary label. Steve Rifkin, one of the founders of the label, heard Twista's first single and thought that he was dope. Loud Records at the time were just a promotions company. They were talking about turning the promotions company into a record label. At the time, one of their promoters in Chicago knew my manager and took my CD back to LA with him. My man Fame, who used to work at Loud Records when it was a promotions company. He liked my music and flew me out to LA. They heard my first single, Mr. Tongue Twister, Hocus Pocus, and they were fascinated by my rap style. I ended up being the first rapper on Loud Records. Running off at the mouth failed to chart on any notable chart that you can think of. According to Steve Rifkin, this album sold around 100,000 copies. This is according to him, but back then, an artist selling 100,000 copies was looked at a lot differently than it is today. By the time it came to Twista dropping his sophomore album, his team had asked for a release from Loud Records who were distributed by RCA. This release would be granted and Twista will go the independent route for this portion of his career. 1994 would come the release of his sophomore album, Resurrection. Resurrection was a time where I was slightly rebellious against the fast rap style and I wanted to show people I could rap in different ways. Rebellious against the style people had pinned on me. I liked that album a lot because I could show my versatility and my flow. When people are like, man, Twista only raps this way, the Resurrection album is something I will pull out to show them other ways I rap. There was a bit of drama behind this album due to it having the same exact title of Common or Common Sense's sophomore album that came out in early October of 1994. Twista's album would come out just weeks later in the same month that Common's album would release. According to Twista, this would be a complete coincidence, but Common's album ended up being more known. What Twista's album Resurrection is perhaps most known for is his diss song aimed at Naughty by Nature because of what Tretch from the group said about him in the song. But after Resurrection, Twista was in a terrible place due to the album not doing so hot. He had to go back and get a normal job. This turned out to be motivation for him due to Twista taking rap more seriously to save him from the everyday life of working. It would be around this time when AK-47 from the Chicago rap group Do or Die would run into Twista on the west side of Chicago. During this interaction, AK would inform Twista that Do or Die had a song called Pole Pimp and asked if Twista wanted to get in on it, which he ended up doing. Pole Pimp was originally released independently and was a major hit in Chicago. Somehow, it ended up getting the attention of Houston-based rap label Rap A Lot Records, who would sign Do or Die and re-release the song, which they did in July of 1996. The song is notable because it would essentially reinvigorate Twista's career, with the song peaking at number 22 on the Billboard Hot 100. Was never say Twist to be giving women dick in the bed until they sick in the head. And if I ever leave a weather day, they ain't tricking the feds or spitting gang with a chicken the bread. Kicking Twister would absolutely obliterate his verse, and one of the main reasons why is because he was working a normal job when he wrote it. He did not want to go back to that, so he put his all into the song Pope Pimp, which ended up going gold later on that year. 
This record really catapulted Twista into signing a deal with Atlantic Records at the tail end of 1996. According to the Chicago Tribune, the board of directors at Creators Way Associated Labels, a black owned indie record label based in South Chicago, gave the final nod for a joint venture with Atlantic Records to record an album for Twisted. Wendy Day is credited as playing a pivotal role in negotiating the deal. For those who do not know who she is, she's the lady who helped with cash money and No Limit Records deals back in the 90s. Absolutely insane deals, if you know, you know. However, with Twista's deal, although his project would be funded by Atlantic, Creator's Way would have the ultimate say-so over how Twista's album is produced and marketed. The deal was estimated at $3 million by industry insiders involved in the negotiations and was considered a big deal, especially for a Chicago indie label. Under this deal, Twista would immediately get to work and release the first single, Emotions, for his third album. Emotions would just miss out on the Billboard Hot 100 by one spot, but managed to peak at number 11 on the Hot Rap Singles Chart. Twista's third album, Adrenaline Rush, would be released a couple months later in June of 1997. The album ended up peaking at number 77 on the Billboard 200 charts. Despite the album not getting much radio play initially, it did end up going gold in 1999 and platinum 20 years later in 2019. Get It Wet was another single from the album and this managed to crack the Billboard Hot 100 charts, peaking at number 96. I think that it's insane that this song was not a bigger hit because it's really catchy and still sounds great to this day. I feel that way towards a lot of Twista songs, to be honest. My favorite song from Adrenaline Rush though has to be the title song from the album. I was born to get you pumped up. It's like some lead bus, cause again motherfuckers a head bust. And your head bust when you jumped up. This, and if I'm not mistaken, the whole album would be produced by the legendary Traxter. He's from Chicago as well, and he's very notable for not only playing a huge part in Twista's career, but he quite literally helped shape Chicago's rap sound alongside people like No ID. He even produced tracks for Do or Die, with him notably producing Pope Pimp, and as I said, that song reinvigorated Twista's career and became Do or Die's biggest hit. Now after Adrenaline Rush, it would be 7 years until Twista released another album. During this time, Twista released multiple projects. In October of 1998, Twista collaborated with fellow Chicago based hip hop group The Speed Not Mobsters for the album Mobstability. The album peaked at number 34 on the Billboard 200 and the lead single In Your World would narrowly miss out on the Billboard Hot 100 charts by one spot just like Emotions. The very next year in 1998 came the release of Twista Presents Big Ballin' which was followed by Legit Ballin' Volume 2 Street Scriptures in 2001. Adrenaline Rush 2000 would of course drop in the year of 2000. Twista would also notably feature on Memphis Bleak's song Is That Your Chick which charted at number 68 on the Billboard Hot 100. It's one of Twista's favorite features that he's ever done, but during the long time of Twista not releasing an album, he had serious legal issues. There was a copyright infringement lawsuit in response to Twista allegedly violating the terms of an agreement by releasing unauthorized music due to his legit ballin' series set to be unauthorized releases. This lawsuit would be filed by Traxter, who co-founded Creator's Way, whom Twista was under when he made his deal with Atlantic for the Adrenaline Rush album. It's reported that Twista allegedly filed for bankruptcy in an attempt to get out of delivering the five remaining albums on his contract with Creator's Way. He was facing $150,000 in damages, court costs, and legal fees. This lawsuit held up what would become Twista's fourth album, Kamikaze. Eventually, Twista and Creator's Way would reach a settlement in 2001.
before ultimately signing a new solo deal with Atlantic Records that was reported to approximately be around $6 million, Twisted would be courted by other labels. Diddy and Bad Boy Records had a lot of interest in Twisted with the two parties notably having a history as far back as 1997 when Twista featured on Diddy's album No Way Out. Dame Dash and Rockefeller Records heavily courted Twista as well, but this deal would never go through. When asked about why he never officially signed with Rockefeller, Twista would say, because we couldn't come to a business agreement between Rockefeller and Atlantic. As far as I could represent was being down with them as people and a crew. But as far as actually having the Rockefeller imprint on my record, we couldn't go that far. Because of how affiliated Twista was with Rockefeller, there are a lot of people who think that Twista was signed to them, but this was not true. As he said, he was signed to Atlantic, but could not work out a deal between the two labels. But now with Twista's legal issues out of the way and having a new record deal, he would finally get a chance to focus on Kamikaze. The road to Twista's fourth album Kamikaze was a bumpy one to say the least. In the first part of the story, I detailed the issues that Twista faced which prevented him from releasing the album while also being unable to capitalize off of some of the success of the features that he was doing. Kamikaze would first be announced in 2001, with the beginning of 2002 being the hopeful release date. There were a lot of things planned for the album that ended up being changed. Originally, Swizz Beats, Dr. Dre, Kid Rock, Timbaland, and many more were set to be on the album, but none of them would end up appearing. Early 2003 is another time the album was scheduled to be released, but the date would be pushed back once again. From what I know, the first promotional single for the album that was pushed would be the song Tattoo all the way back in 2002, which Twista talks about in an interview with MTV that year. In this same interview, he also referred to a song called Favorite Drink, which I assume is the song Drinks, which made the final cut of Kamikaze. He says that he planned to push that song as a single and do a video for it, which I'm happy that he did not. He did do a video for Tattoo, but honestly, I don't think that Tattoo and Drinks were good singles to go with, especially with what was to come. I think due to at least Tattoo not performing the best, the album got pushed back. That's just my speculation though, especially since that was back in 2002 and Kamikaze did not come out until the beginning of 2004. Late 2003 is when everything changed for Twista due to the song Slow Jams with Jamie Foxx and Kanye being released. Ultimately, this song would top the Billboard Hot 100 charts and be the biggest hit of his career. Before Twista hopped on the record, it was a song that Kanye had already had. He wanted Twista to be a part of the song, and the rest is pretty much history. It was a regular time in the studio working with Kanye to make something dope. For me, what was neat about Slow Jams was when I decided to implement all the old school R&B artists in the song that had Slow Jams. So I started thinking of Luther Vandross, all the different names, and so all my metaphors were about pioneers in R&B. Just really coming up with the patterns and the words that would make a dope verse a dope song. But I never thought the song would go that far. I pretty much had it down on how to tailor a monster verse. And Twista did deliver a killer verse on the song. There could seriously be a whole video dedicated to the history behind this classic song. It's already been covered extensively in interviews by Twista and Jamie Foxx along with the story being told in Kanye's Netflix documentary. Slow Jams played a pivotal part in everyone's career that was involved in the song. Twista credits Jay-Z as being the person who wanted the song to be the first commercial single for Kanye and Twista's albums at the time. Slow Jams would be the only commercial single released prior to Kamikaze with the album finally releasing in January of 2004. This album would top the Billboard 200 charts, selling 312,000 copies in its first week, a far cry from his previous performance, Adrenaline Rush. Twista was on top of the rap game, and there was still more to come. 
Overnight Celebrity would be the next single with that song peaking at number 6 on the Billboard Hot 100. Kanye would produce this as well and it would become Twista's highest charting song as a leading artist. For some reason, that girl playing the violin in this video creeped me out as a kid. I don't know why, but she just did. She's dope though and pretty much looks the exact same from what I've seen. So Sexy featuring R. Kelly would be the next single with it peaking at number 25 on the Billboard Hot 100. Sunshine, although a great song, would not manage to chart on the Billboard Hot 100. So Sexy Chapter 2 like this barely did though with it peaking at number 92 on the Billboard Hot 100. This did not matter though because Kamikaze managed to go platinum just a month after its release. This album is insane from top to bottom. There are so many great records with my favorite one outside of the singles being Kill Us All. Twista was truly on another level when he did this song. The songs Kill Us All and Get Me actually happened to be one of my early introductions to Twista with both of these songs being featured on the soundtrack to the 2005 game LA Rush. Yo, if I just unlocked a memory or childhood memory, I'm gonna need you to hit that like button because this used to be my game back in the day. Twista was all over the soundtrack and speeding through LA while Twista is rapping in the background unlocked so many memories. He also had a song called Get That Dough that appeared on this soundtrack that I'm surprised did not become a big hit because this song is a banger. I definitely am about to go online and cop this game off of eBay or something. I have no clue what happened to the copy that I used to have, but I need this game again. Twista actually appears in the game if I can remember correctly. But going back to 2004, and Twista would appear on another big record with that being Trick Daddy's song Let's Go, which managed to peak at number 7 on the Billboard Hot 100. Everything was going well for Twista, with him finally receiving mainstream attention and having commercially successful music. The lights were shining so bright, but things would get really dark for him in September of that year. He would be injured in a car accident that unfortunately killed one of his bodyguards and seriously injured people that were in the car. Twista would be riding in a van that crashed near Erie, Pennsylvania around 4 a.m. on a Monday. The van was traveling from Syracuse, New York to Chicago when it hit the median and rolled over several times. All of the passengers in the van were ejected from the car except the driver who was the only one wearing a seatbelt. Arthur Dixon, Twista's bodyguard and longtime friend, was killed in the single vehicle accident. It was reported that the driver of the vehicle, Twista's cousin, fell asleep at the wheel. Everything that Twista had going on was this close to coming to an end and it's unfortunate that this happened. A situation that Twista had to deal with long after the fact is with the widow of his bodyguard suing him over this. Years later, another bodyguard of Twista's would get killed and the details in this case are horrific. Rest in peace to both of these men, definitely gone way too soon. But Twista would recover from the accident in 2004 and gear up for his fifth album. The day after would be released in October of 2005, peaking at number two on the Billboard 200. The leading single, Girl Tonight, featuring Trey Songs, was released a month before the album. Girl Tonight will peak at number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100. The next single hit the floor, did not crack the Billboard charts, and neither did the last single, So Lonely, which featured Mariah Carey. From the day after on, this would be Twista's last album to chart in the top 5 of the Billboard 200. Skipping ahead to 2007, and Twista would drop his 6th album, Adrenaline Rush 2007, 10 years after his 1997 album, Adrenaline Rush. Adrenaline Rush 2007 will peak at number 10 on the Billboard 200, selling over 41,000 copies in its first week. It's reported that the album dropped off the charts quickly, falling to number 48 in its second week with over 20,000 copies sold, then falling out of the top 100 entirely. 
Twista would be asked why Adrenaline Rush 2007 did not sell that well, and he would say, because the label did not push the record that much. They pushed it just enough to recoup. Right around that time, the music industry started to change. That was when the re-emergence of the whole 360 deal started taking place. Me being a well-rounded artist, they knew it was about time for us to part. They just didn't push my record as hard as they could. This album ended up being Twista's last album under Atlantic Records with him parting ways with the label the next year in 2008. When talking about this in an interview with Hip Hop DX back in 2008, it was noted that there was tension between Twista and the label when the label's A&Rs removed tracks from his The Day After album. It's said that they replaced raw street tracks with more commercial songs. Adrenaline Rush 2007 was also cited as a source of problems between Atlantic and Twista as I previously stated. I should add that Twista was very disappointed with the lack of push the label gave his single Give It Up from the album. The company changing and people who were at Atlantic when Kamikaze was released being fired afterward also contributed to Twista's decision to leave. It wouldn't be long until Twista formed a partnership with EMI and Capitol Records through his company Get Money Gang Entertainment. He was once again on the independent route and would drop his seventh studio album in July of 2009. This album would be led by the single Wetter, which peaked at number 44 on the Billboard Hot 100. Really dope song by Twista that really helped him get back on track with Category F5 doing slightly better than Adrenaline Rush 2007. Category F5 will peak at number 8 on the Billboard 200. This album is also notable because it would be the reunion album of Twista and Traxter working together again since their fallout. He produced a little under half of this album, but he would produce almost all of Twista's 2010 album, The Perfect Storm. I actually remember this album vividly because my dad had this album back in the day. He definitely used to play Adrenaline Rush back in the day, but I do remember when this album came out and my dad had it. This album would fall all the way to number 38 on the Billboard 200 though. Within a year, Twista fell down the charts 30 spots. From this point on in Twista's career, he was already a legend. Definite Chicago legend for sure, but from 2010 to now, he's released over 10 projects. I would be here all day if I had to break down and talk about each and every one of them. Throughout these years, musically, he's managed to show people that he was nothing to play with, whether it was on Chance the Rapper's 2013 song, Cocoa Butter Kisses, or Tech Nine's 2011 song, Worldwide Choppers, being examples. It's really inspiring to see the complete turnaround Twista did once he appeared on Do or Die's song, Poe Pimp. Without Twista featuring on that song, he could have just been another rapper in the 90s that came and went. We would have probably never gotten anything that Twista released after 1994, which is insane to think about. I always believe in the power of one and how one thing can change everything. In this case, it would be one feature that changed the trajectory of Twista's whole career to what he has today. Twista leaves behind a very solid legacy. He's a shy town legend for sure and was one of the first rappers in Chicago to make it in the mainstream. I definitely think that Twista is underrated in a sense because when I hear people talk about the greats, I feel like they do not mention him, which is absurd. He has the talent, influence, longevity, has classic songs and albums in his discography. He has a style that stands out, especially within the genre of fast rap. Obviously, his biggest year happened to be in 2004, which was 12 years after his debut album came out, which is crazy. That Kamikaze album solidified Twista in the mainstream. He was truly on fire at the time, and although his time on top was short, it was still very memorable. I've mentioned his longevity, which cannot be understated. He came in the game in 1991 as a rapper who people did not really understand at the time. Some people felt like his fast rapping style was gimmicky and that it could only appeal to a niche audience. After tweaking his flow a bit and rejuvenating his career, he went on to drop a smash hit in Kamikaze. He managed to drop hits as far as 2009 with Wetter. With all of this said though, 
I really appreciate you guys for sticking around until the end of the video because it really means a lot to me. Twista is one of a kind and I'm really glad that I finally got through to making this video. All in all, let me know what you guys think of the video. I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.